uh, I, I pressed the wrong square on my complicated screen and shut and shut John off. All right, John, you, you were saying that there's um, a, a movement afoot to, uh, in this project called Save the News. So maybe maybe start that bit over again. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, it's, it's just part of the, the world we all live in, right? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so we, we Save the News, it's a campaign that we launched, savethenews.org, but you can also find information at newsguild.org, our website. Um, and it, it, basically our goal is to try to be able to advocate for journalists in this moment that really happened at the pandemic level when it started, where we just saw a huge loss of jobs across the news industry um, when people needed them most. Hmm. So the, the current most interesting piece is the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. It's a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation that actually has a decent amount of Republican support because uh, everyone likes more local, right? Local jobs, local journalism uh, is, is important for, for anyone, no matter their political preference. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe people who are corrupt, they probably don't want it so much. But, <laughs> That's a good point. But the Local Journalism Sustainability Act basically would provide tax credits uh, for businesses that employ local journalists, up to $25,000. And it's regardless of whether you're a newspaper, you're digital only, uh, or you're mm. broadcast. Uh, so that's, I think, a really good thing. And mm. I think that's something that we should consider making permanent. Because again, go back to the founding of this country, um, the, post, the post office was basically set up to uh, cheaply distribute newspapers and magazines. So at yeah. a huge loss to the federal government subsidizing that. Uh, because again, we were like, huh, this democracy thing don't, doesn't work if we don't have people informed. So uh, it's a model that has been in existence since the beginning of our country. So I like the idea of a tax credit for local journalism jobs, because that would be employed and you know, employing people where they, where they should be in their communities. So I, I can see on the savethenews.org website and on the newsguild.org website, you have these, at, you're advocating for, it looks like five particular things that you mentioned. Uh, Providing incentives for financial investors to sell news organizations to civic-minded local investors. That's super interesting. Like, I guess the government could either incentivize or demand that a certain percentage of news organizations are owned by local groups that wouldn't suffer from some of the things that you were describing some of the investor class has, has put in. Um, and then these tax credits and grants that, 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 that you were talking about. Um, uh, uh, and then breaking up corporate ownership of news organizations, and then two other things about increased access to government records and protect journalists and their sources from prosecution. A couple of things that the government could do in its practice, as much as its as much as its uh, actual structure. Um, how, how is that coming along? Are there sponsors for this for this bill? Is it does it feel like it's sort of on the verge? It, is is one political party more supportive of it than the other? Uh, what, where where is it currently set? Well, it's uh, you know so the local journalism sustainability act you know had bipartisan support was in, was included in Build Back Better, including you know co sponsors of uh, uh, Joe Manchin and Kristen uh, Kristen Cinema, so that's good, and it also had a lot of uh, local. Uh, support too from Republicans. Um, you know, this this idea to break up corporate ownership of news organizations, we don't have anything specific on that front yet. Um, I think the Department of Justice actually could do a way better job enforcing antitrust laws uh, and realizing that, mm. you know, there is a, a huge problem if a hedge fund like Alden Global Capital comes in and wants to buy a publication. Right now, they're, they're trying to buy Lee Enterprises, you know, which is uh, one of the largest newsrooms that, that Lee has uh, is this... Uh, the St. Louis uh, Post Dispatch, and if Alden bought it, they would basically try to cut staff and really try to extract as much money as possible. So the Department of mm -hmm. Justice could weigh in now to um, to basically say no, this 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 transaction should not go forward. Right now, it's kind of on pause uh, because the board is is pushed the hedge fund off. But I mean, the Department of Justice could regulate these things and think about it on a local level, so we can mm -hmm. prevent more and more consolidation. Um, there's the idea, uh, there's no specific piece of legislation uh, live on this yet, but where basically a company could get like a tax break, like, you know, sort of like a charitable donation tax break if they uh, gave um, a, a publication back into the community. Because uh, mm -hmm. one of our, our ethical obligations as journalists is to be accountable to our community. And if, uh, you know, yeah. it's, it's a local newsroom that's owned by a huge monolith that, you know, its finances are based in the Cayman Islands. It's not properly serving, you know, a community like Denver. Um, so, 
how can we actually support that to be like local ownership there? And then, you know, the tax credit I talked about earlier exists right now for the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. While that's stalled out here in D.C., it's actually moving forward in a couple places. New York State's got uh, a similar piece of legislation and Wisconsin as well, uh, particularly to provide uh, a tax credit to local businesses who want to advertise in local media. Yeah. Um, I could imagine there are people who, when they hear this, they get super nervous about more government uh, power inside the newsrooms. You know, there's this like independent journalist world. H how do you all talk about that and reconcile not wanting the government or certainly the federal government to be the one uh, sort of dictating the terms by which reporters and journalists are, are operating. Is that, I guess that's sort of the other side of, you know, having to work for some, you know, quote unquote, corporate overlord or some hedge fund manager, you know, uh, how, how, how do people, how are people responding to this? Is it mixed inside the guild? Is it uh, great, great support one way or the other? Well, journalists are, are, are tend to be very uh, apprehensive about, you know, engaging in anything that's partisan. So, you know, for most of us, we'd never donate to political campaigns. Uh, some people, if they live in a state where you're required to register with a party to vote in a primary, actually refuse uh, to vote in the yeah. primary. Uh, some journalists even don't refuse to vote because they don't want to have any record, even though it's private information, on how they voted so that they can actually yeah. go out in the world and try to be unbiased. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big piece of conversation. But um, you look at, you know, like like I said, look at Canada, look at the United Kingdom. You know, they are holding government officials accountable, even if they're getting more and more public financing for their operations. So mm -hmm. it's very possible to do. They do that at NPR. Um, so it's totally possible to do. And I think there is a concern of, of control from, you know, one administration to the next, right? Like we don't want, you know, whether you're a Republican or you're a Democrat or you're independent, you, you probably don't want someone coming in and mandating it. That's why I think one of these things like the tax credit is really good because it's not looking at picking winners and losers. It's just like, are you local? Are you a local journal place that, you know, employs uh, local journalists? Uh -huh. If so, here's your tax credit. Uh, and so it's not actually picking winners and losers. I see. It's, it's, it's incentivizing certain behavior and believing that local journalism would be, would be better. Um, any pushback on that? Are there other people who say, no, actually, uh, local journalism uh, has proven over time not to be a better product or doesn't actually work like that? Is there, is there any movement that has been sort of uh, concerned about local uh, coverage or local reporters or any of this? Yeah, there hasn't been much of a pushback. I think, again, the sort of the pushback that I see is that when people like kind of put everything into like one monolith called the media, right? So if you yeah. can avoid doing that, that's a good thing because you could talk about how you think that MSNBC is too biased to the left and then Fox News is too biased to the right or whatever. But then look at your actual local publications. You know, how are they actually covering the news? And they're probably doing it with very few people, not, not feeling like they're covering enough of your local community. Yeah. Um, I think the people who are most interested in, in, in you know, against, you know, local media uh, is basically very clearly fascist, right? Like that is the people who don't <laughs> want people to actually have information that's free from bias. That's they they really want to shut that stuff down. So I, you know, that's why we have to be careful to not just put the media into one bucket because, you know, clearly having access to, to fact-based information gives us more power uh, as, a, as an individual in a democracy to be able to like know what we're doing. Mm. Um, so, you know, don't lob the ball together because there are people out there really trying to do good work to inform you about your local city council, uh, your school board, uh, and, and cover high school sports, you know, like that used to, that's still like a big part of local communities. Yeah, you know, I mean, I totally agree with you. And then I think about myself and sort of do an inventory of, you know, the space between what I say I believe in and how I actually behave. Um, and, and there's a huge gap, right? Like, I canceled my subscription to the Minneapolis Star Tribune last year, right? Uh, so I, I just think about all the people like me who say this stuff um, we want. But it was sort of like, I don't know, most of the local stuff, I, I don't know, I just wasn't all that interested. It was disproportionately expensive. Anyway, I have all these rationales for why I yeah. did it. But, but that's a thing, right, that, that the very people you know, who would be advocating for this don't actually do it. It's like, 
it's like you know shop local day you know people then kind of go and buy some cutesy thing but still order most of their stuff from Amazon or whatever you know or, or buy it through you know Jerry's hardware which is part of the ace network and it seems local but it's actually just you know the ace hardware center so uh, what short of like subscribe to your local news are there things that people like me who really do care and really do want this to be different and believe it should be different um, but you know are, are met with our own hypocrisy on a regular basis uh, do, do you all have I mean you have a great clear calls for the you know the, the save the news act or I guess you call it the uh, local journalism sustainability act do, do you have any advice for for the regular folks who listen to this podcast and others if they want to be more supportive of journalism or the news in general about what we should do yeah so i mean you, you call your representative call your senators uh to tell them to to support the local journalism sustainability act i think is is uh, key right now um but you know it, it does i mean you know i subscribe to a lot of different publications whether they're local national or international um and you do have to kind of look at it i think being engaged more is another way of going about it right so if you're seeing things mm -hmm. that are not being covered in your community you know send constructive feedback um reporters get a lot of hate mail you know like calling them awful <laughs> names uh, and treating them terribly but they love when people say hey like i thought this was an interesting story have you ever thought about like writing about this or this is a big story happening in my community um i think engaging more and i think it also requires too the the management you know and, and we're a union we represent the journalists but i think it also requires the management to think about you know, that, that, that issue of being accountable to our communities. I saw a really good uh, way of handling mm -hmm. this uh, in Seattle at the Seattle Times, uh, where we represent the workers there. They had a pretty regular once a week meeting where, um, you know, every day they talk about what's going to be on, on, uh, on the front page of the newspaper and on the website, yeah. the main stories of the day that they're hearing from across the newsroom. Uh, and they're kind of plotting out their coverage for the day. Well, once a week in those meetings, they actually brought in people from the community uh, to listen in and and see how how you know the editors are actually thinking about the sculpting of news in that community, and then at the end of that meeting, they asked the people that they brought in from you know churches or, or local advocacy groups or, or whatever. They asked them, well, "What feedback do you have for us? What do you think about this? You know, what's what stories are we not covering?" And I think that's a really important thing is remembering that our bond is with the mm. communities that we represent and providing feedback in both directions, I think is also really important. And then, and then oh, I think investigate it because Minneapolis Star Tribune is owned by a billionaire right across the border. Uh, you know, in St. Paul, it's owned by Alden Global Capital, that really evil hedge fund. And you can look at the size of the staff in one place or the other. And yeah. St. Paul's been decimated. Decimated. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It became sort of a, I don't know. It changed a lot. Um, Hey, do you have another minute to keep talking? I know we started yeah. a little late. I don't know if you had a hard stop. Um, but what is the life like? I mean, you're, you're in some ways you have to work on big issues and all these newsrooms and you're a, a union like organization at the News Guild. Um, what's life like for for journalists? You know, a lot of people feel like journalists are part of that elite class of people that they don't have contact with. And maybe you follow some of them on social media or Twitter or something. And tweet something at them here and there but people that are on radio and television and in print news and online news um, can you just tell us a little bit about the life of of journalists and what what do you think a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't know that would be helpful for them to know to understand journalists and how they live and function in their their work lives yeah so i mean you get we represent a, you know kind of a wide swath of people from yeah. the canadian broadcasting corporation the new york times to the casper wyoming uh, star tribune and I grew up actually myself in rural Arkansas, in Harmony Grove, Arkansas. So, you know, it feels a little funny for me to have, have made it to a large publication at the LA Times, where I worked for about six years and then now as president of this organization. Um, and we see, you know, we, what we've seen is that journalists are just really tired of, of, of dealing with a lot of crap from their corporate owners. Um, so, you know, Gannett is a huge chain. We've had a huge a number of uh, journalists organized there. And in fact, in the past, four years uh, alone we've actually uh, in terms of people who have unionized uh, which every private sector worker can form a union if you've got one colleague in, in most industries is that uh, true not a manager oh. Oh. Uh, and so <laughs> you know we've had um 6300 workers join our union in the past four years you know from uh, places like you mentioned earlier atlantic uh, those journalists joined us last year politico joined us last year loveland uh, 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 a publication a small paper in uh in outside of Colo uh, denver colorado 
uh, joined us. So we've had just a huge wave of, of journalists wanting to unionize because every private sector worker has rights under the National Labor Relations Act to collectively bargain for better things and be able to discuss their wages, benefits, and working conditions with their colleagues. And uh, and so that's really like trying to increase the standard of pay because journalists are not paid very well. Very low paying job for most people outside of the cable TV, outside of the New York Times. It's, it's a low paying job. Uh, you're asked to cover a lot of uh, different subjects, mm. become basically an expert of them, yeah. uh, and then go out and report that information. Um, and then they're also, you know, being conned into work overtime, right? And and companies like Gannett, who who are profitable and pay huge sums of money for their executives, end up really trying to pressure journalists to to not take and not uh, not claim overtime. Uh, and, and even misclassify them uh, so that they can't file for overtime so that they work 40 hours a week and the journalist is like, oh, I got to get this story right. I need to like do a little bit more work. So they maybe work five, 10 more hours a week on that, that story, that news story. Uh, and then the, the company basically doesn't want them to file for it. So it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty wow. difficult hmm. life. Um, but, you know, that's why they've organized. They basically have formed unions to negotiate. And so, you know, I, you can see it over my shoulder here, but that's, those are, yeah. uh, from the New Yorker magazine, which recently unionized, and uh, you know everyone there was 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 gearing up for basically a strike, but they raised the the pay uh, for the the lowest paid employees up to what would be more livable in New York City, uh, because wow. they said you can't eat prestige. So even if you feel like you're working for a publication <laughs> that's good, you might not be paid you know well enough. Yeah, your 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 landlord doesn't say you can pay thirty percent less for your rent because you work for the local. Or national news outlet that's yeah. not that's not a thing um, well that's th thanks that's that's really helpful I really wanted to sort of get into the you know f again for a lot of people th they don't think about the individual human beings behind producing the news that that's that all of this is done by people every sentence uh, you know is written and someone has to edit it And then someone's got to get it out. And then, the, you know, there's tech workers who who have to get it out on the apps and on the website. We lost your audio. But it is it is one of those things where it's like, you know, there are a lot of people involved, you know, in the whole process. Actually, today we've got ballots going out for a union election for about 600 tech workers at The New York Times, which uh, you can you can follow them online if you uh, go to their their Twitter account, but it's the New York Times Tech Guild, uh, and those folks are, are are fighting to unionize, and they run basically the apps, uh, the website, make sure that it's it's actually functioning, uh, so people like us can get access to like how many COVID cases are in our community or what's the most recent breaking news story. I still can't hear your audio. Grab here, I guess, <laughs> with the audio being out. Thanks so much for the time. <laughs>